welcome to Undercurrent. I'm your host, Lucy Nicol. This week, the Salvation Army have released their report that has found that 2.5 million Australians live on less than $20 a day, with 600,000 of those people being children. With Australia being one of the wealthiest nations on earth, why is this happening? Laura Novo demands the answers. According to the Global Finance magazine in 2015, Australia is among the 10 richest countries in the world. But according to the Salvation Army, 2.5 million of Australians are struggling on a daily basis, living below the poverty line, which means that they are living with less than $20 a day. 600,000 of them are children. What do you think we are doing wrong? as a society, um, in one of the wealthiest nations in the world, having the 10.8% of our population uh, struggling on a daily basis. Unfortunately, there's many things that we're doing wrong or not doing. So, for example, we don't have a national poverty plan. So we don't have a coordinated approach to how we're supporting people um, in poverty and how we, uh, what policies we have in place to move people out of poverty. Um, and so every year people are shocked with the figures that you've, similar figures that you've just quoted because we're not making enough progress. We have huge inequality in this country where we're seeing growing disparity between people that have a lot of wealth and those that don't. So we are in, uh, that is also contributing. And that's going to, unless we address it, that's going to turn into intergenerational poverty. The reality though is that there are always people that will fall through the cracks of society due to uh, mental illness, depression, uh, drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, you've got all sorts of de uh, social depravities of life which people um, will then suffer through and the impacts of that are, are very significant. So it, it, you're always going to have this, this aspect of our community struggling. I guess the question is for us is how do we respond to that and how does government provide services that can try and support those people at greatest need? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it could be a very good exercise for politicians um, in this country to get to leave for a week with only $20 a day or less. So I've in fact done that um, a couple of years ago. I lived for only a week on Newstart, um, which is at the time was about $17 a day. Um, and it is extremely difficult. And even though I was only doing it for a week, you get a very clear lesson straight away about what you can and can't buy. Thinking about even, can I catch a bus? Have I got enough money in my purse to be able to catch a bus to get to Centrelink? You know, because you have to go into Centrelink. You have to go to job interviews. You have to have a phone so you can maintain contact to do your um, mutual obligations when you're on income support. All of those sorts of things, until you actually limit yourself to that amount of money and have to think about it, um, and think, I can't go and just buy the cup of coffee that, you know, like I would normally not even think about going down the street to buy a cup of coffee. But when you're only living on that amount of money, $4 or $4.50 for a cup of coffee is basically a quarter of the money that you've got to live on. And so I think that policymakers all need to have that experience. Only a week really isn't long enough, but it does give you a taste for it. Think about it now, I was down there at one stage in my life. I had a daughter, just me and my daughter, and yeah, it was hard paying rent. I lived in someone's carport, and, and so there you go. I was only earning $40 a week at that stage. This had gone back a few years. Mm. I had to pay $10 for the shed I was living in. Then she charged me $10 to look after my daughter, and so then I had to eat and get to work. So when I had a couple of days off work, so I can understand how people get down there. How can we break the cycle of poverty? I think they should teach in high school how to budget. Maybe kids wouldn't end up on the poverty line if they knew how to budget and how to use credit cards and tell them the truth about credit cards. Look, I think what we've got to try and do is work uh, very intensively on certain aspects of our community that are impacting this. Uh, one of the things we would argue is education standards. Um, one of the things that impact young people in growing up is their capacity, their levels to earn, is very much dependent on their levels of education. So what sort of job they can get uh, determines their, uh, their earning capacity. 
But that also is very much dependent on what education levels they've achieved at school. A lot of children, uh, young people out of uh, families that social depravity uh, exists, uh, drop out of school. Um, so they don't reach any levels of education which will give them that ability. So then their expectations are lowered. I'll just become this, I'll just do that. Um, so their, their expectations in life get modified around what they think they can achieve and they never achieve their full potential. Some people are arguing at the moment that having 2.5 million of Australians in need, maybe the government should put more effort into helping this situation, solving this problem, instead of, for example, helping refugees. Considering that Australia is such a wealthy nation, is one of the wealthiest nations in the world, do you think that this is right? Do you think that actually Australia has the power to help these two problems? Yes, yeah, I do. I do. All they've got to do is budget. We're a wealthy nation. We should be able to support our most vulnerable members um, of our community as well, as well as welcoming and supporting new members of our community who have fled terror, who have fled persecution and who are simply seeking a safe haven. We can afford to do that and afford to lift people, enable people to move out of poverty. Well, if we bring everyone here, it's going to like, you know, everyone's going to get poor and that, but obviously, yeah, the government should help everyone and make everyone even, whether you're Australian or not, because, you know, you're humans and it's just the humane thing to do, really. You shouldn't, like, leave anyone left out, definitely. I definitely believe it's a balancing act because on one side, as citizens, we want to help as much people as we can. On the other side, we have to help ourselves before we help other people. So I definitely believe, you know, it's a controversial topic because, you know, as an Australian citizen, I believe it's right to help others before you're helping yourself because it generates a better society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's a very hard question, actually, because it's, um, it's a fine line. So um, I suppose at the end of the day, you got to look after yourself first to be able to help others. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't help refugees. I think that the world needs to do that as well. But we also need to look after our our own people that are here suffering now. Laura Noble reporting for Undercurrent. Artist Ross Potter displayed his latest works this week with his exhibition As Is, which explores the impact of the creative world on Fremantle's heritage buildings. Laura Novo had the pleasure of attending. We are today at the exhibition As Is by Ross Potter, where Fremantle Heritage Buildings have a second lease of life, here at Moore's Building in Fremantle. Ross Potter has become an indispensable figure in the Fremantle art scene. This highly talented illustrator, originally from Brisbane, navigates through the heritage buildings of Fremantle, capturing their beauty as it is today. This is the biggest piece in the exhibition, Torn, and I think that it reflects perfectly what you want to transmit. What can you tell us about this building? This was me really working with this style of photography and pushing it out. So we compiled about 37 photographs just to really capture a documentation, quite an accurate documentation of the building. You can't normally see it from one view, so we really wanted to try and get the whole building in and yeah, I, I started buying my paper on a roll, so let's see how big we can go. And um, 2.4 metres is the biggest we can fit down my stairs at the studio, so we can't go much bigger than that. But um, yeah, so it was really, and filling a space like the Moors building, you really have to think about size, and I like to keep things minimal, so the size had to be pushed out, and this was the um, more challenging sort of aspect to try and do. And um, yeah, it was quite a big investment to do it, but it was well worth the while, and yeah, so, if this building is going to change soon, which there's a lot of proposals that it might, um, hopefully I've caught it at this point in time and everyone can remember it from that. So, yeah. I believe that this exhibition touches you, touches your heart very closely. Um, can you tell us why? Yeah, it is a really... Because it touches me because one of those exhibitions that I think is all my favourite things is by a great free metal artist, but a drawing extraordinarily beautiful and intricate and delicate drawings of beautiful Fremantle artistic icons, all the way from 
your traditional ones like the Fremantle Arts Centre at the other end of the spectrum, all the way through to the South Fremantle Power Station and and, and the like. It's, uh, but it, it, it's got the best of Frio. What has brought you here tonight to the exhibition as is by Ross Potter? Uh, I just wanted to see what Rob Ross had been up to. Um, they're beautiful drawings and it's part of Fremantle's heritage. Facebook, basically. <laughs> I had a, an invite from Ellen, Ross's partner. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I thought I was looking at photographs. And I can't believe the quality of the work. It's amazing. It's just so intricate. Uh, well, I have a business just up the road in High Street, so I heard this exhibition was on, and I love pencil drawings and, and, and graphic art like this. My daughter, in fact, is a graphic artist. So uh, uh, I'm here, and I think this exhibition is beautiful. This, this building here, was, which is absolutely iconic, and somebody in the government and the councils are going to do some really nasty things with it, I fear but it should be brought back to its original beauty and should be a public building and it should be there for ever. Dross, this is uh, your favourite piece. Could you please tell us why it's so special for you? I think just getting inside this place and seeing the amount of activity that goes on inside it and as the rest of the show goes, this was a much more refreshing view to draw, so a much more internal can really pull you in, um, but really just capturing the lengths that they go to to do their art in there, so getting up into the beams and just the um, uh, just the heights that they get to and the sort of danger aspect to it and the um, amount of graffiti that can happen all the odd spots, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it really is a great documentation of what goes on inside the powerhouse, I feel. Mm -hmm. Which piece is your favourite? My favourite ones, I think, really are actually some of the ones that talk about the more ephemeral parts of Frio art like the ones that took around the, the Goldsboro wool stores, where every day it changes, the graffiti changes, but what Ross has done in his work is shown it as it is today, for a moment. But it will change and it will evolve. I think my favourite is probably Vent, um, the inside of the power station. The view looking out over the balcony down past the power station. I, I, I think that one's my favourite, but it's it's really hard to choose. I would have to say the dingo flower, very definitely. Um, that's something that's really quite familiar to me. I run along that stretch of beach quite frequently, and yeah, it's, it's a beautiful piece as well. So far, it's good to see the old power station. Uh, it's obviously an iconic building, which is um, um, it's been in the news. You know what's going to happen to it, what what should happen to it, these sorts of things. It's a um, a bit of an issue for debate, but it's nice to see it um, uh, in its present form, nice and big on the far wall over there. This piece, actually, the dingo. Um, it's something that you see every day you go to the beach. It's iconic for Western Australia. It's something that's iconic, but not built to be a tourist attraction or something like that. Just something that you grow up seeing every day, every time you. I don't know, you associate it with the coast? Uh, I think probably the, uh, the dingo uh, flour mill, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those items which is iconic to Fremantle and uh, uh, recognisable, probably much larger than the Fremantle area. And uh, I even used to get bags made out of uh, dingo flour bags. What has been the most challenging part of this exhibition? Probably trying to decide which buildings to include and which ones not to include. There's so many buildings around Fremantle that have been affected by the creative industries and so it was really hard to narrow it down to these um, few that we selected. We ended up focusing on buildings that have been affected by visual arts. Um, because otherwise, there, you know, there's so many. There's Spare Parts Puppet Theatre, there's the Fly By Night. It's a really artistic town, so that was probably the biggest challenge. I don't really see things in colour so much, so I, I find if I don't have the exact colour, it wouldn't tell the right story. So the neutrals really, I feel, tell the story of the character and pull that out. Almost black and white photography versus colour photography, I suppose, as well. With pencils, you only have the limited colours, or you can buy the big ranges, which gets a bit expensive. But So I'll play around every now and then, but I really... I, I don't see much graphite drawing around, so it's really working my advantage that um, it's a bit more unique. Mm -hmm. This is 
Slavrinov reporting from Moore's building in Fremantle for Undercurrent. Now it's time for a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Undercurrent. Now forget all the hype about bitcoins and the depreciating dollar because being paid with a slab of beer is back in fashion. Laura Novo finds out just what you can trade for a couple of icy cold ones. Social networks have revolutionized the way we communicate, how we interact and now the way we trade. Beers and other beverages have become the currency of choice of many people and Facebook is leading this phenomenon. But the Perth's beer economy is not only a site where you can try it for your favourite drinks, it is also a great example of the genuine Aussie spirit. We are today with Paul and Frank, who are two admins of the original Perth's beer economy Facebook group. It's just a site. It trades items for booze or you try uh, trade booze for items. Yeah. It, it's not a bidding page, it's it, it's get in first, you get the item, and sit down and have a drink with a person and go home with what you got, it's great. Why did this group started? Well, it wasn't so much why, but uh, myself, John Davis, and uh, my daughter Chantel, we were out the front of the house having a few coldies, and uh, we started talking about the, the Aussie tradition of swapping beer or cartons or whatever for uh, odd jobs or items, you know, like uh, the neighbour might go, oh, you might go to your neighbour, oh, come and mow my lawn, will you? And you might say, oh, for a carton. So, you know, so that's how it's always been in my day anyway. And we sort of saw it was, was lo we were losing that a bit. John went away and thought about it for a while and uh, he says, well, why don't we start a group? And just for fun, really, just for a joke to start with. Uh, but then it's just uh, morphed into a into a monster, you know, really. It's just gone from, uh, you know, from, from 300 people, just friends of ours, to now uh, over 68,000 members. Why do you think, Fran, that this group has grown to be so popular among people? Yeah, well, like I said, it just started as a, as a joke, just trading for booze. But it's become more than that now, you know. It's become a, more as a community, because um, all our members sort of get together and do things. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's a now, now there's, there's charities involved. There's um, uh, people, people are a bit hard on their luck, you know, having a bad time. Our members will get together and help them. Yeah, we've got multiple people donating their time and effort to fixing um, uh, people's air cons and their cars to get their sick kids to and from hospital. Um, people down on their luck trying to find jobs on the page. People have gone out of their way to help them do that. To, um, uh, to pick a kid, sick kid up from uh, Princess Margaret Hospital and then take him to the Monster Truck Rally at Domain Stadium to um, a lady who's simply asking for um, hampers for the dog refugee in Shenton Park just, just to help the dogs out for Christmas. 68,000 mates, that is a very impressive figure. Uh, how many people are joining Perth Beer Economy a week? Well, um, when we got to 20,000 <clears> originally, when we got to 20,000, which we were surprised at to start with, uh, we made the group a secret group. And that was because a lot of um, scammers and trolls were trying to get into the group. So we made it secret, so we had to add them individually. Um, and it's, it's funny enough, as soon as we made it secret, uh, we were getting like 10,000 new members a month. Um, and that was for three months straight. It's calmed down now. Now we're down to probably five to 800 a week, uh, new members. Unfortunately, there is, a, there is a group that have sort of, um, more than copy, they've, they've used our name and everything. It's Perth Beer Economy full stop, basically, they are now. and. And it doesn't worry us at all, you know, as such. But it is a worry to our members. Our members do a lot for a charity. They do a lot for the some needy people. And this other group, run by Michael, he's taking credit for what our members have done. That's why we changed our name from uh, just Perth Beer Economy to the original, because that's exactly what we are. Uh, but because we've got to become a secret, it makes it a bit harder for people to find. But if they, if it's easy enough. If they go to the, if they uh, search the original Perth Beer Economy, we've got a link page, and they can go on that and find out how to actually get onto our main page. And uh, yeah, well, he keeps he keeps telling me to add that. He said, make sure everyone that joins uh, give a couple of beers to the admin. You know, uh, obviously that's not necessary, but most welcome. <laughs>
Laura Novo reporting for Undercurrent. Now, while we're on the subject of alcohol, two guards have been caught drinking alcoholic shots at their workplace and have been sacked by their employer, Serco. Jack Middleton has the full story. Hello, I'm Jack Middleton. So this week, two security guards were caught drinking spirits outside Perth Courthouse. They were then later fired. That's really the beginning and the end of this story, but hopefully media coverage like this makes us more aware of what role companies actually play within our country. This is the Serco Group. They run all seven immigration detention centres in Australia, but they do lots more. In fact, they're probably the biggest company you've never heard of. Governments all around the world outsource to Serco. In Australia, Serco have a presence on every military base, run every immigration detention centre, two prisons, cross-country trains like the Indian Pacific and the GAN, and they're bidding on more contracts right now, including one to run prisons across New South Wales. So, even if you don't know their name, chances are you're caught in their web. According to its website, its main focus is to provide excellent and outstanding service to its customers. Now the question is, can we trust a selfless and caring and multi-billion dollar corporation to manage some of our most basic services? Let's find out. The authorities that run the Villawood Detention Centre don't have the appropriate powers to stop riots. I was told that the scenario was unrealistic and it would never happen. He's suggesting changing the laws, for example, to allow them to force detainees off roofs. It just shows again that this, this government was not prepared for the chaos that was unleashed and in the detention network. The Assistant Commissioner's uh, evidence today was clouded by the fact he doesn't know who is in these facilities. She also criticised the department's media policy. The Australian Border Force Act of 2015 prevents anyone from talking about what goes on in these centres. Now that includes acts of violence, cases of mental abuse, uh, abuse of children, all of which go on in these centres. And we know all these things happen thanks to people who put themselves out there at risk. A guard has broken ranks with the government and Circa, the secretive company that runs the centre. On Christmas Island, bin 13 is code for the document shredder. Among guards, it's popularly believed that Serco keeps the truth about what happens from the government. This guard says it happened to a report involving an attack on him. Who shredded the document? A Serco guard. A Serco manager. Yeah, officer, yeah. yeah. These people are a mix of all kinds, not just rapists and drug dealers, but doctors, nurses and teachers and mothers as well. If we have ever been conditioned to fear and reject people fleeing from a different country just because we believe they might be different and dangerous is wrong because the majority of these people are just normal human beings like you and your family and your friends and people that you know. We're a private company delivering services to the public sector, so um, transport, health, detention centres, we do business outsourcing, that sort of thing, so very, very diverse um, and very global. As if they weren't doing enough for us already. Fiona Stanley Hospital is one of the, the contracts, and what was important to us is, you know, we needed to ramp up in such a short period of time. And they're doing a bad job at that too, as doctors are saying that sterilising of equipment is taking way too long, which is... Well, putting patients at risk. Service delivery excellence. <laughs> Once you turn over things like a school, a hospital, prisons or the military to a company that's out to make a profit, some very important things can then come second to money. There is really too much bad press out there to get through into detail, like security officers being fined for brutal treatment of prisoners, a massive overreaching of 68.5 million pounds from the British government and basically proving that the privatisation of prisons is bad due to their management of them. The privatisation of our basic services is a slippery slope and the more we outsource them to multi-billion dollar international corporations, the more we are at risk to lose. So perhaps instead of fearing people from a different country who have no power, no influence, no safety or money, Perhaps be more suspicious of big businesses who are out to turn a profit from your literal suffering. This has been Jack Middleton reporting for Undercurrent. It's been announced that the government is going to use our driver's licence photos 
for their databases and use them for facial recognition without our consent. When Nita takes to the streets to see just what people of Perth think about this invasion of our privacy. The Australia's law enforcement agencies will be using facial recognition in the future to efficiently search for offenders. So they will get your photos from your official IDs like driving licenses. They will do this without your consent, so they'll just take the photos. So um, are you happy with this decision? Sure. Do the crime, pay the time. Yes, I think that'll be fine. I'm not too worried about whether they find anything out about me or not. So I don't mind if it's like only used for like in the purpose of serious crime enforcement, not for like petty crimes and stuff. Well, I'm perfectly fine with it. I don't really have anything to hide, so they can monitor me all they want if it helps catch the bad guys. I'm all for it. <laughs> How about you? I'm completely against it. I think <laughs> we're turning back to old Russia and uh, socialist kind of movement. No, I feel a bit unsafe about it actually because, you know, anyone can get hacked. Do you think that privacy no longer exists in today's society now that they're doing this? Uh, I think a lot of reasons privacy is a thing of the past. I think there's a little bit of privacy but not much. Like with Facebook and everything, they, obviously there's hardly any privacy with Facebook. Uh, not a great deal, um, but you know, if you don't have anything to hide it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Everyone's putting more and more stuff on the internet these days and it's just going to be a free-for-all soon, so it's pretty hard to keep stuff private. <laughs> In the, some cases it's alright, but it's getting a bit over the top. Well, after facial recognition and all this, no. Because anyone can access this and your information is just out in the open. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> you can't hide no more. <laughs> Between Facebook and Instagram and whatever else you are, there is no privacy. The FBI have said that they are okay with 20% of inaccuracy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, this basically means that anyone could be accused of uh, a crime or anything just by similar facial recognition, right? So s similar facial features would, you know, maybe cause the blame on someone else. A bit too much room for error. <laughs> well, you still want to be on that 20%, do you? I would think it would be 100% accurate if you've got facial, you know, photo. How do you think this would impact the lives of the people who have been wrongly accused? Terribly. Like, even if it's just an accusation, like, that would have huge ramifications on, like, their work and personal life. It's really unfair, to be honest. It'll make it a lot tougher for them, that's for sure, um, especially to re-assimilate into the, you know, general population. That is a difficulty, uh, and that's been a difficulty for many years, innocence or guilt. No good, is it? If they're being accused wrong, it's, I mean, it's got, it just goes without saying, don't it? It's ridiculous. It shouldn't happen. We're Nida Azman reporting for Undercurrent. I hope you've enjoyed this week's program. I'm Lucy Nicol and I will see you next week, same time, same place, on Western Australia's current affairs program, Undercurrent.